Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, John Cameron, author of Rewire and Rekill and PLF uh, Development Officer, Jeremy Talcott and Johanna Talcott, who are uh, Pacific Legal Foundation College of Public Interest Law attorneys. And uh, we're going to talk about a few. You're also libertarians, right? Yes, that's I mean, correct. I mean, not, not here in your official capacity, <laughs> uh, here as, as uh, interested citizens. Let me ask you a quick question. How did you come to self-identify as a libertarian? Johanna? I'll start. Um, just a little bit of background. I am a recovering liberal. Uh, I was in academia. I was studying anthropology. Did you have your button for a hundred years? <laughs> my She's chips. got a couple chips. Yeah, chip. yeah. Yeah. I've years, earned my chips. Three years sober. Uh, <laughs> But uh, just about five years ago, I was actually pursuing a PhD in anthropology, and I had spent a good 10 years in higher education surrounded by liberals. And um, I'm sorry. If you have any experience. That would put in, almost anyone off. <laughs> if you have experience in that type of an arena, I mean, it's, it's an echo chamber. And um, I never really thought about it one way or another or, or kind of questioned it. But um, a, a couple things made me start to feel uncomfortable with um, the things that I was thinking or, or whatever. I, and so basically it, it was one thing that I started questioning and I think my brother uh, sent me to a blog and said you need to check this out and read about it and that blog linked to reason.com and, and then I read stuff from Cato Institute and it really snowballed from that point. And with, within about a three month period of time I had decided I was libertarian. I decided to quit graduate school and go to law school. I had learned about PLF. I knew that I wanted to be on the front lines of of the fight um, for liberty and, and wanted to do constitutional litigation. What was the blog? Uh, Coyoteblog.com. It's a, it's a businessman named Warren Meyer out of Arizona. Uh, he privately runs federal parks. He does uh, takes over private contracts. Um, but he just blogs about libertarian issues and has been for... But what was the specific subject matter of the blog that you first read? Well, for me, it was he all... He's, his kind of pet interest is climate science. And um, oh. I was... <laughs> I was for my... climate lack of science. Right, yes. right. Climate science. Political science. Right, right. <laughs> but um, I, was, I was in a environmentally based uh, sub-discipline of anthropology, environmental archaeology. And so I studied and, and, and was familiar with a lot of the methods and, and science that, that is used to kind of further the, the climate science um, agenda, I guess. And that, so that's what it was. I was talking about it with my brother. I think you were a skeptic to a certain extent on, on the uh, science involved. At this point, yeah, now. Yeah. I mean, at first, um, I would be in classes, and, and you really, it was hard to kind of question anything. But mm -hmm. I, we would be reading articles, and I could see that the, the data didn't show what, what the authors were saying it showed. I, Imagine it was... that. So no causation? <laughs> These models didn't reflect reality? A little bit of that. I am shocked by that. And I, I went to Pennsylvania. They were predictive? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> they couldn't tell the future. I know. It wasn't yeah. a crystal ball. But I went to Pennsylvania State University, which is where Michael Mann is. And he's kind of the center of Climate Gate. He developed the hockey stick model of climate change featured in Al Gore's documentary. So... Mm. So They're totally I, disproven, uh, statistically invalid. Not in his mind, um, <laughs> but yeah. So it was, it was, it was that point that really got me. So, so Jeremy, how did you uh, come to uh, get to a place where you decided to uh, to uh, infiltrate your sister's mind? <laughs> you know, when I was younger, I think I was just not very political. Really, didn't think about it much, uh, one way or the other. And I will. Sort of blame punk rock music, you know. I was really into punk rock when I was which, younger. Which band? Oh, you know, Dead Kennedys. Uh, huh. I, the Clash is really my favorite, to be honest. The Clash. Um, they <laughs> Even I know of this. Still just <laughs> solid, um, absolutely solid music. But uh, you know, there was so many bands that were political, and but not most Rush. of them. Yeah, I, well, I do like Rush, although I usually don't admit that, and especially not on TV. But <laughs> or amongst any of your peers, <laughs> but, people uh, <laughs> within three years of your age. Yeah, you yeah. Um, but you know, I 
there was so many bands that were political, and most of them, you know, were spouting about anarchy or, or communism or socialism and things like that. And so I just started reading, and and I guess at, at some point that kind of led just to a libertarian perspective. And I saw that so many of my friends who were into the same type of music, you know, they all said anarchy's great, and now I'm going to go vote for welfare. And I just <laughs> thought, I don't know how you can reconcile those views. So. Uh, again, I discovered Coyote Blog, I discovered Reason Foundation, discovered that, and just, it really snowballed from there. Okay. Well, let's talk about the, the libertarian perspective on a number of issues. Bring you into the conversation, John. That's all right. We have some phony wars <laughs> going on in the Middle East. Uh, well, we've they're got, not phony to the people on the ground. We've got, well, they're phony in the sense that there appears not to be any incentive or any uh, actual uh, determination to actually win the wars. We've been at war in Afghanistan since uh, 2001. We've been in war uh, at war one in, in one manner or another in Iraq since uh, in the mid 2000s. We've mm -hmm. been at war in Libya uh, on and off uh, ever since Obama came into office or shortly after, mm -hmm. and it goes on and on and on. Syria is the most recent mm -hmm. uh, war that doesn't seem to have a beginning or an end or an end game. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by phony. Well, I, I think that, that um, there is an endgame that we don't talk about. Um, I'm, I'm a veteran. I was a paratrooper. I used to jump out of airplanes and carry a machine gun for a living. Um, and uh, I won't tell you how long ago that was, but it was a long time ago. And so... Uh, it was on the other side of the world. We can say that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, was, um, <laughs> it was... We didn't carry spears. We actually carried guns. So it wasn't, all that, it wasn't long ago in geologic time. Um, there's, there's, we, anytime you have a toy, you're going to play with it. And, um, Eisenhower warned even longer ago than I was in the military uh, about the military industrial complex. And what happens when you create a war machine and, and direct all your energy and economy and debt and everything to a certain area, and you try to dismantle that, the people that have made fortunes, uh, the generals, the people who are used to running these armies and everything, they're resistant to give up power. Um, and so you have people who have a vested interest in maintaining the war machine. If you have a war machine, you have any toy you're going to play with it, which is why, you know, all these SWAT teams get called out. Every town of 10,000, over 10,000 in this country has a SWAT team and a hostage negotiator. I don't know why. So they have to look for instances where they can shoot somebody and negotiate. When you got a big um, hammer, you've got to look for some every, nails. You know, if all the only tool you have in your toolbox is a hammer, everything becomes a nail. So, but I think there is a vested interest, a number of vested interests in keeping these wars happening in the Middle East. Um, we're there's an oil thing going on, and um, it's 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 funny how uh, that these these little wars didn't heat up until um, the U.S. started to become energy independent. And we couldn't, heaven forbid, have the U.S. being energy independent because then, um, you know, basically Israel could do whatever it wanted to do and the Arabs can't have that. So there's a number of special interests going here and it's not just the war machine. And whether you can um, say that somebody has an interest in ending these wars or not, the, the, the neocons, the liberals, the, the candidate for the Democratic Party, which used to be the Peace Party, is more <laughs> hawkish than anybody since, well, I don't know who, uh, John McCain. Mm -hmm. I mean, less, he's probably less hawkish than he because he's, seen, he's seen, what, seen what's going on. So, But there is an understated reason that nobody talks about for us being uh, constantly uh, in wars, and that's having blooded troops. Any hit, uh, student of military history will tell you that unblooded troops against blooded troops, people who have actually been in battle, uh, are two to ten times as effective as green troops, people who've never been in battle. And one of the reasons why people are a little hesitant to mess with us on even ground is that we have blooded troops and have had blooded troops since before the Vietnam War, and nobody else does. I mean, that one of the reasons it's impossible to win a war unless you're willing to turn the uh, the country into a radioactive crater in Afghanistan is because that's all the people in Afghanistan have done since probably recorded history is read the Koran since a thousand years ago, smoke, hash, and fight. That's all they do. So it's a little hard for anybody to come in and pry them out of their caves. 
And also they have no infrastructure to destroy. Trying to bomb them back to the Stone Age, they're already in the Stone Age, right? So there's an underlying theme there. But as far as being, um, and I'll get off my high horse here in a second, <laughs> as far as being um, an arm of foreign policy or diploma, there's none of that going on. We are the worst um, diplomatic solution people in the world. People, that's why it's so hard for us to have allies, because we go into places on a whim, change our mind on a whim, change sides that we support on a whim, and get out. So it's very easy to say that the only or reason... Or don't get out. Or don't get out. The only reason that we're in there is to be there. I mean, just to use this war machine. I get you. Well, I, in the military-industrial complex, I yeah. think, is at the heart of it. It's a, a, a defense industry that makes a hell of a lot of money uh, selling bullets and guns and, mm -hmm. and uh, war machines, and a uh, military complex that likes playing with their toys, as you mm -hmm. pointed out. And uh, well, if you, it's you know, a self, if you have a West it's a, Point. It's a self-fulfilling, yeah. vicious yeah. circle yeah. that uh, doesn't end, and the politicians are always looking for a distraction from problems at home. And there's no, there's no better uh, distraction from problems mm -hmm. domestically than a... Find than a nice war. Find, find, <laughs> or, find, or the find next a, topic, a nice terrorist. Find a villain instance. someplace uh, overseas yeah. that you right. can uh, blame everything on, and that's that's essentially... I mean, in the uh, email leaks, the WikiLeaks on, on Hillary's email, her first go-to was to say, well, that's because the Russians were hacking, uh, hacking mm -hmm. and right. blaming it on Putin. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, come on. <laughs> I was using a private email server. It's, it's Putin's fault, and people are actually are actually buying that. At least Democrats are. So, okay, enough about war. One kind of phony war. We have another kind of phony war that's going on. It's the phony war on terrorism, and it's very much related, of course, to the war, uh, to the actual shooting wars. Well, anything there's. I don't know who said it. Um, see if you can remember the quote. Richard and I have discussed this. Yes, we talk about this stuff not on the show as well. Um, somebody said, anytime you want to increase something, um, just declare war on it. So our war on poverty, more poverty, our war on drugs, more drugs, war on terrorism, more <coughs> terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so um, terrorism, the threat of terrorism is a great excuse to take away civil liberties. It's a great excuse for those in power to gain more power. And without a perceived threat, it's really hard to sell people on, look, I'm in the government and I want to take your rights away because I like having more power. <laughs> Is you okay with that? Um, but if you say, ooh, the terrorists <coughs> are going to fire up a nuclear weapon in San Francisco, and in order to prevent that, I'm pretty sure they would if I wasn't here to protect you. Now, unfortunately, in order to protect you, I'm going to need to read all of your emails to make sure that a terrorist isn't hiding in there. Listen to all your phone calls to make sure that one terrorist isn't calling another. And by the way, have the right to stop, stop you on the street and search you whenever I want. If you can create a, a, a phony boogeyman, <coughs> then you can more easily extract rights from people and gain power. And that's what's going on. The problem here is that we're, we have such a dumbed down populace that many of them are falling for it. However, um, you guys aren't quite millennials, so you're a little bit past that. Um, I'm well past it. Proudly so. <laughs> um, people in, in that age group are realizing that somehow, despite having graduated from public schools designed to dumb them down, that this is phony and that their rights are being usurped for no reason. And we see evidence of how bad the so-called war is every day. <coughs> Just one example was the most recent TSA audit. 95% of the contraband got past the people who are paid to keep the contraband getting past. I think they would have done better if they would have paid them to try to help <coughs> the contraband get through, because every time the government tries to help a process, it makes it less efficient. So yes, phony war on terrorism. I think, though, that the next phony war will be against the aliens. That are well, coming. yeah, certainly that's, that's uh, <laughs> I didn't put that on the list. We could talk about that, the, you know, phony, <laughs> phony war on, on, uh, on uh, aliens, uh, uh, Earth aliens uh, as well as... Uh, ah, Earth aliens as well as aliens. <laughs> as well as See, space the nice aliens. See, the nice thing about, the nice thing, we should do that, just 
maybe have a drink before the show instead of after, yeah. and talk about an imaginary threat that nobody could disprove, <laughs> because we're the only. Well, we have people. a we have a, we have a war that's been going mm -hmm. on since yeah. the LBJ administration, and that's the war on poverty, mm -hmm. and the poverty level is statistically almost exactly the same yeah. now mm -hmm. as it was back in the in the 1960s mm -hmm. when LBJ declared the war. What's that all about? Well, you know, I mean, I think. Uh, just like John just pointed out, I mean, if you really want to get more of something, let's put the government after it. So, uh, you know, I think the big problem is when government does it, they manage to do it in the least efficient way. The, the only solution government sees to poverty is to create a massive bureaucratic nightmare that sucks up a huge amount of money and distributes a relatively small amount of money and manages to do it inefficiently and probably with poor oversight and probably to the wrong people. So, uh, Question, when you get to a stopping point, I have a question. Go right ahead, please. Um, we're, we're assuming, um, I think we're being nicer than we should be. We're assuming that the stated intent is the real intent. It's my mm -hmm. thought that the unintended, the supposed unintended consequence, which is this transfer of wealth and mm -hmm. this massive government bureaucracy you're talking about, was the intended consequence. And the war on poverty is simply a, uh, a knee-jerk or a tear-jerk method to create a massive redistribution of wealth and a massive government bureaucracy and a massive victim population that is dumbed down enough to vote for more of this stuff. That's my position on it. Well, I think, you know, as you mentioned, the, the poverty rate hasn't changed. Well, a big reason that the poverty rate hasn't changed is when they calculate those poverty numbers, they exclude any funds that have been given out supposedly to help poverty. Well, why would they exclude those numbers? Why would they exclude that income in order to keep that number high to continue to justify the welfare state? So I think... And the other thing about the welfare state is, I mean, what it, it does two things. First of all, 70% of the money that goes for welfare. Uh, is going to administration, mm -hmm. and 30 percent goes to the actual welfare recipients. So it's the bureaucracy that makes out like a bandit. The second thing that happens is, is the people that actually do receive welfare benefits uh, are beholden to their masters. Mm -hmm. They're beholden to the bureauc bureaucrats at the welfare office, uh, at the food stamp, or whatever. I mean, they, they you know, are essentially told to keep voting democratic. Uh, and uh, in favor of the politicians that will keep these programs going because if you, if you don't do that, you're going to you know, end up homeless on the street. And that's using fear against the most vulnerable people uh, and giving them a very, very small stipend uh, to keep them uh, voting in the right way. Uh, LBJ, at the time that the, the war on poverty was enacted, said, I'll, I'll have blacks, he didn't use that word, but I'll have blacks voting mm -hmm. Democratic for generations. And mm -hmm. I think that's uh, very cynical. Is that a quote? Yeah, it's a real quote. Uh, not not verbatim, but but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm you know. I'm gonna find it. Yeah. Uh, not so, to prove you wrong, but just because the next time I get in a conversation with a liberal about this, I want to have that. <laughs> I want to have that ammunition, that arrow in my quiver. And the other yeah. thing about the war on poverty is is that we have the most giving uh, society probably mm -hmm. in the world, or have did have. And that if you have private agencies whose real motivation is to actually get people out of poverty, mm -hmm. out of a, 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 a dependent lifestyle, they are able to do so quite effectively and did so quite effectively for generations yeah. prior to I think that's, the 1960s. That's really the huge tragedy of it is that as you, as the government claims to take over this role, it discourages private actors from doing it. and It displaces the private actors. And uh, it, when you think about who better can help someone and, and accurately assess exactly what the needs are of someone who, for whatever reason, is in poverty, a local you know, Christian charity who's actually in that community can look and assess whether that person does need money or instead needs some sort of help, treatment, uh, treatment. mental health, any exactly. number of things that yeah, are I mean, contributing to if you look at If you look at alcoholism, the best right. people for treating alcoholics are other reformed alcoholics, mm -hmm. former alcoholics. They've, they've been there, they've done that, they know 
uh, what it's all about. They know how to uh, in inspire people to, uh, to move away from it. If you're talking about people who are the best at getting rid of poverty, it's people who work in something like the Salvation Army because they have been there and done that and they know what it's all about and they can, and they can effectively get people on the right track instead of uh, on a, uh, continuing well, you, on a you dependent can, track. You can see examples. There are certain segments of uh, American society, and I'm not a religious person, um, but there are um, there are organized religious groups in this country the, whose populations basically refuse to take advantage of the services offered by the government, food stamps, welfare, whatever. And these churches tithe at a minimum of 10%, and somehow out of that 10%, they, they build magnificent edifices to their religion, and they take care of people who belong to those religions to the extent that they never go without food, they never go without shelter, they never go without an opportunity. They find them a job somewhere, somebody to help them, and they do this building the magnificent edifice and at a tithe of 10%. The government has the 70-30 that you talk about and a whole separate budget for building edifices called government <laughs> Office buildings. Uh, we, our office is right next door to a couple of palaces of <laughs> half a billion dollar waste. So, absolutely agreed. Private sector mm -hmm. um, does a much better job in helping people and get out of any of these things. You know, like you, like you mentioned, Richard. I mean, the when you look at how charitable Americans tend to be when we look at every time there's a tragedy across the world people line up to donate money mm -hmm. and the war on poverty is an area where they've stepped back and generally don't because they're expecting the government to do I'm, it. I'm so. reminded of the Cajun Navy which uh, went in to uh, help the uh, uh, yeah. flood victims yeah. in Louisiana uh, in the most recent look flood. It's fine this year. Four, <laughs> they went in there and they, were, they effectively mm -hmm. saved people and took care of business and they were Shoot away by government FEMA cannot mm -hmm. abide that because they did not <laughs> want competition. Well, let's let's give it another example. There's a little company called Walmart that people love to hate. Mm -hmm. While FEMA was still trying to figure out where to meet to look at um, what to do, um, the the charitable arm of Walmart, the giving people, had a meeting and they said, "Well, how many?" Yeah, we get a couple million dollars in one of the stakeholders, shareholders, one of the original Waltons said, no, 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 we need to do more. And within hours, they had a fleet of Walmart trucks pounding down the highway with water and diapers and food and blankets and tents. And, and it made the FEMA effort look as Cuny. feeble. Yeah, sure, but how much and did they pay the drivers? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm willing to bet a lot of those drivers said, yeah. I'm doing this for free because yeah. those people need help. Final, final phony war I'd like to talk about is the phony war on drugs. This was one of the most unfortunate legacies of the Nixon administration, and he had a whole lot of unfortunate legacies. This is one of the worst. We could spend probably 24 Don't hours of shows. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And I think also one of the most salient right now because of what's happening with um, police and, and Black Lives Matter and a lot of the movements that are going on right now about the problems that we have with police forces, I think a lot of it stems from this war on drugs because mm -hmm. what you do when you prohibit something that is otherwise you know, harmless to, to anyone except maybe the user, you create, you, I mean, you criminalize something and you criminalize everything around it. So now it's not just the thing that itself that is harmful, but it's the buying and the selling of it, the, the transactions um, involving, you know, uh, getting involved with people who are, <laughs> sorry, um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Man, help me if out I, here. Do you mind if I jump in? The, um, again, phony war, anytime we declare a war or something, it, it increases. And I think we have to look at this again. What was the stated intent and what is the real intent? This war is such a failure that at this point, I think you can pretty much say that the, uh, the intent, because this is what's happened year after year after year for 40 years, is to enrich um, cartels and, and create uh, $40 billion to $100 billion a year of untaxed income 
that needs to be cleaned up to buy legitimate businesses. Because yeah, that's it's, what's it's, happening. It's the, it's, the, it's the bootleggers and Baptist Alliance uh, mm -hmm. revisited. It's the night, you know, it's prohibition uh, applied to marijuana and opium and what, uh, you know, heroin, mm -hmm. whatever. What's even worse? The interesting thing about the drug laws is the history. The history of drug mm -hmm. laws in the United States, there were none up until about uh, the 1890s or somewhere mm -hmm. around there. The first drug laws were came about because of uh, the, the Chinese who were brought to mm -hmm. California to build the uh, work on the work during the, the build mm -hmm. the railroads and, and, mm -hmm. and work uh, in the gold mines had a cultural practice of using opium and had mm -hmm. they had their yeah. opium dens. The opium was made illegal. It was mainly made illegal because of a cultural and a uh, racist intent to discriminate against the Chinese. It built from there. Uh, every drug law that you can think of probably had originally a racist uh, 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 component. I Same way with the marijuana laws against blacks. Yeah, if we had to talk about every law that probably initiated with a racist uh, component, we'd need several more shows. We would. <laughs> but the point <laughs> is, the intent to yeah. save people from the scourge of drugs, never mm -hmm. part of the intent. The intent actually was uh, much more malign than that. And the simple fact of the matter is, is that about two, you know one, two, three percent, maybe something like that, mm -hmm. of the population uses used hard drugs mm -hmm. in the form of patent medicine back mm -hmm. in the 19th century. Same number applies today: one, two, three percent, something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. is the number mm -hmm. of people that use hard drugs with the drug war trying to to uh, wipe yeah. it out. It's not going to work. It never yeah. will work. It does provide a huge budget for the DEA, a huge budget for. Local uh, police, local courts, police, and prisons, and whatever, <laughs> and that is something that uh, prisons, uh, prison guards, police, uh, prosecutors, corrections officers, corrections yeah. officers, yeah, you name Not it. Prisoners. There's a huge, a huge number of people who are benefiting from the drug war financially, and the people who use drugs are simply uh, pawns in the game. You know, I wish I could remember the name of the comedian, but uh, one of the greatest jokes I heard is, you know, there's a war on drugs. It's been going on for 100 years. That kind of means that the druggies are winning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that also leads to abuses uh, like civil asset forfeiture. And we just have a couple of minutes left. Mm -hmm. Civil asset forfeiture is primarily about the drug wars, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, anytime any... Uh, a car or a home is in any way involved with an illegal transaction or an illegal act, the government can essentially go in and take it. And or not. They can go in and take it and they don't have to prove they that there was any crime. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, they don't have to prove that, that there was any wrongdoing and, and they can... They can take your car, they can take your house, sure. they can take your boat, Money. whatever it is. Your cash, If especially. they take it, you have to prove that drugs were not Right. You ever have there. To, right. You have to prove have it in order to, to get your property back. Exactly. You have to prove a negative, which is always a hard thing Which is to impossible. Do. Right. That's the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint, on uh, YouTube, on the web at uh, accesssacramento.org, and of course on Channel 17 and various cable channels all over the place. Thank you very much for being part of the show. See you again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Good show. Thank you.